Hello and good afternoon and welcome back to the last presentation of day four of the Yeovil Chamber Business Fair. We're very, very pleased to welcome Catherine Merton from Pardo Solicitors today, who is going to talk to us about wills and LPAs. So uh, there will be a question and answer session at the end. So please feel free to sit back, sit on mute, listen to Catherine, make a list of all those questions and I'm sure she'd be happy to answer them at the end. So over to you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Joe, and thank you for the invitation to come and chat to everybody today. Um, so I've been asked to talk to you about wills and powers of attorney, um, but I've been asked to try and make it fun and interesting. Um, now, I've got to say that when we're talking about dying and losing mental competence, fun and interesting isn't the sort of thing that springs to mind, but I will do my very best. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, I know Ben does know me quite well, but for everybody else, I'm Catherine Merchant. Um, I'm a partner at Pardo Solicitors. I'm the head of the private client team. Um, Pardo's was established about 100 years ago, which I think most people don't even know where Pardo's are, but we're in Bridgewater, Taunton, and Yeovil. Um, and in Yeovil, we took over from Marsh Warry in Princess Street. Um, and so we're in their old offices there. Now, as you're probably aware, solicitors these days specialise in a particular area of law, so we can't be a jack of all trades. So my area of law is private client, um, which includes wills, probate, powers of attorney, tax planning, trusts, and elderly client matters. Um, so at the end, there's going to be a chance to ask any questions. I'm pretty good on my own subject, okay? But if you have any other legal questions, feel free to ask me. Um, I can pass them on to a colleague and we can always come back to you on those. So when I was thinking about what I was going to talk about this afternoon, I, I thought, well, shall I talk to them about statistics? I could give them all of the figures and, you know, but you know what? I've been to so many of these things and it's so dull to have lots of figures thrown at you. Um, so I think the only statistic that really is quite interesting is how many people in this country actually have a will. So actually, it's only one third of the country, one third of adults have made a will. And it's not the third of adults that you would expect either. So it's not the older population that have made wills. Um, it is mainly the youngsters, um, probably because they are perhaps buying a house with somebody they're not married to, um, or because they get married, or because they have a child. Those sort of things prompt them to make a will. The older generation that haven't ever quite got round to it um, have lots of reasons why they think it's going to be difficult and never quite get round to it. Um, so what I would say is if you haven't got a will, then you really do need one. All right, you do need to really think about that. I think there's a lot of myths out there about um, what happens if you don't have a will. And a lot of people say, well, I don't need a will because I'm married and if I die, everything will go to my other half. Um, and there is a certain amount of truth to that. So if you die without a will, you're said to have died in testing. Okay, so that's a word you might have heard quite regularly. Um, and the spouse will get the first £250,000 of the estate. Okay, so once upon a time, £250,000 probably covered most estates. But these days, because house prices are so high, you know, most estates are now above the £250,000. So if you die without a will and your estate is worth more than 250,000, your spouse will get the first 250,000. Everything above that is divided into two. Half will go to your spouse. The other half is, is split equally between all natural children. So that means that if there are children by a previous relationship, they could end up owning part of the house just by virtue of the rules of intestacy and it can cause no end of problems. It can be very, very difficult for people to sort out. The rules of intestacy also don't cover an awful lot of things that you might want to include. For example, legacies to family and friends, um, to charities. Um, they don't include funeral wishes. Um, they don't protect against things like nursing home fees. All right, so, you know, it's really, really important that a will is, is use so that you can actually make the best of those things. So really to summarise on that, first of all, have a will. Secondly, if you're being quite smug now thinking, oh, I've got a will, um, have you got a will that's up to date? Because actually an old will is almost as bad as having no will. 
So sometimes an old will will have somebody in there that has passed away or you've fallen out with, or you've left something to somebody that you have sold or you've given away. Okay, so a will should be looked at at least really every three years, if not every year, just to make sure that it's exactly what you want and that it's completely up to date. Now, I don't want to bore you with too many details. And what I thought I would do is look at a few historical wills and a few disastrous wills um, and just give you a bit of a feel for what can go wrong and what you can do, because people have no idea, really. I think I'm really fortunate to do what I do. Um, I've done it for a lot of years, and I've always said that when I stop enjoying it, that will be the day that I retire and give up. Um, but it's an incredible thing to be able to do a will for somebody because they are letting you into their lives and they're giving you a lot of um, insight into to their very personal information. And I've always felt that it's quite a privilege to do that. Um, but when you do make a will, what you want to be sure of is, is that you eliminate all problems. Okay, so we do have very strict wording of wills, which does mean that some of them are a little bit dull and we don't, don't quite say what we want to say. So some of these that I'm looking at are American um, because the Americans just say what they think. And so the wills tend to be quite a lot more interesting than the British wills. Um, there was a time when if you made a will, that was your last wishes and nobody would contest it. But of course, we've become very good now at using our legal system and people are not afraid to contest the will. Um, so I quite often get asked, well, what grounds can people contest the will on? I think it's worth just looking at it so that you are aware of what grounds you know, could be utilised. They're quite restrictive, actually, and it's quite easy to make a valid will. A valid will is just in writing, signed by the person that's making it, two independent witnesses sign in to say that they've seen you, you sign that will. So it's quite easy to make a valid will. Um, the grounds on which it can be contested. First of all, someone can say that you haven't got mental competence to make it, i.e. Like you didn't understand what you were doing. Now actually the bar is really quite low on wills. Um, you need to be able to understand what your assets are and you need to be able to understand who you're giving them to. Um, and really that's it. That's the bar for mental competence. We don't see very many wills contested on mental competence. Um, the times that they are contested is perhaps where somebody was on heavy pain relief for various reasons. Um, we've seen some contested where somebody was perhaps um, an alcoholic or had some drug dependency um, because mental competence can go in and out there depending on you know, where they are at the time. Um, but it's quite a rare ground for people to contest the will. The second way that you can contest a will is um, under something called undue influence. So you can say that somebody um, influenced that person to make the will and they wouldn't have done it without that influence being exerted. And this is quite a funny one because people seem to think that this is where somebody is brought into a solicitor's office with their arm pulled up firmly behind their back, forced into a chair and told sign here. Um, and of course, that doesn't happen very often. And I think we would probably pick up on it if it did. Um, but the more common one is actually um, duress through kindness. So this is where somebody says, look, I've been doing your shopping for you for the last five years. I bought you fish and chips every Friday evening. I visited regularly. Of course, I really enjoy doing that, but it is costing me money to do it. And you know, I'm not really sure I can continue. And then, of course, the person says, well, I, you know, I can't really afford to pay you. And they say, well, why don't you leave me something in your will then? And that is duress because that person feels that they have to do that in order to, to carry on getting the benefit that they're getting from seeing that person. Um, and, you know, we do see this from time to time. Um, sadly, we wish we didn't. Um, as I said, you can contest the will when it, that it wasn't properly executed, but again, it's quite rare. More so on homemade wills because people don't realise that the witnesses need to be present when you sign. So they will sign and then they'll take the will off round to a neighbour and say, can you sign here? But actually that isn't valid. You all need to be together when you sign. Um, the most common way that people will contest the will is under something that we call the inheritance provisions. Now, this allows a spouse, a natural child, or somebody who was financially dependent on the deceased to contest the will if they haven't been left anything in the will, so if they've not been properly provided for. 
it's quite rare, very rare for a spouse to contest the will. Um, but it's very, very common these days for an estranged child to contest the will. Very often where there's children from a previous marriage, they've not been seen for 30, 40 years. The person dies and suddenly that child comes out of the woodwork and says, but where's my share? Okay, and they have an automatic right, unfortunately, under the inheritance provisions to contest. Doesn't mean they're going to be successful. It just means that the court will entertain the application that they've put in. And this is where really solicitors come in, um, because ideally you've got a will that's completely watertight and we've covered the possibility that someone will be contesting it. Um, we obviously can't cover everything, but we do our very best. Um, contesting a will can be a nightmare and it can also be very, very expensive. Um, so I've got to say, the biggest area of growth for our, our practice is contentious probate. And the most contested wills are the homemade wills. The ones where people think they can do it themselves using one of these apps that you get from WH Smiths or online. And they do it all themselves. And you know, it looks perfectly okay. And it's not until they've died that you realize there's a problem. All right? So I'm always saying, Homemade will is really not a great idea unless your estate is so simple and unless you're absolutely certain you know what you're doing. It's really strange though, it's the very wealthy people that tend to do homemade wills. They seem to begrudge a few hundred pounds for solicitor to do it properly. Um, and then they, they get upset when it's wrong. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of where somebody's done a homemade will and they think it's fine. And the first one is from um, many years ago, and it's outside of our area, a different practice that I was working for at the time. And um, this lady who made the will bought a pack from WH Smith. You might have seen that, it's a little grey pack. I think they're about 30 pounds now. Um, and in the pack, you get a couple of wills, so if you make a mistake, you can do another one, and the instructions on how to complete it. And on the face of it, it seems really straightforward, which is what this lady thought. So she sat down at her kitchen table and she filled out her will and she followed the instructions and she read it all through and she took it round to her neighbours and she signed it and they witnessed it. Perfect. The will was valid. She was happy. A couple of years later, um, this lady passed away and her husband and children um, came into the office to see me and they brought along the will and they said, here you are, she's made this will, you know, everything's fine, we just want you to get probate for us. And I looked through it and there was a clause that I was a bit uncomfortable with and I hoped that it wouldn't cause a problem. Unfortunately, it turned out that it was a massive problem. Um, the lady had a sister who she was really close to, but 10 years previously, the sister had fallen out with this lady's husband. They had a really big argument. And in 10 years, they'd never even been in the same room together. They absolutely despised each other. So the lady had left everything to her husband, bar one little clause, which read, my sister can choose any item of my property as a memento. And she thought that was fine. Everybody thought that was fine until I pointed out that property included the house. And the house was in the lady's sole name. They put it in her sole name for tax reasons. And of course, the sister lost no time whatsoever in telling the husband that he needed to leave and that the house was now hers. Um, it went on for two years, actually. The argument was horrific. And I'm going back probably the best part of 20 years now. And the cost then were £40,000 to get it sorted out. She got far more than she was intended to have because they had to settle on something. And everybody went away feeling really terrible about the outcome. There, were, there are no winners in a contested will. So I've dealt with another one actually quite recently. Um, and this was a chap who actually came into the office. He didn't see me, um, but he did see colleagues. So he came into the office and he said that what he wanted to do was make a will and leave everything to his stepdaughter. And he explained that he had no children, he had no family, um, but his um, wife had passed away seven years previously and his stepdaughter had been absolutely incredible to him. She'd come round, she'd visited, she remembered his birthday, she'd invited him for Christmas. He wanted her to have everything. He was sure that that's what his, his um, wife would have wanted. 
she was to have everything. So the solicitor said, not a problem at all, we can draw up a will for you. Told him what the price was, and he sat back and said, well, that's completely outrageous. There's no way I'm paying you. You know, solicitors are ripping us all off for every penny, you know, and I'm going, and he went. And, you know, like a good man, he took himself off down to the pub. And um, whilst at the pub, he mentioned how awful the solicitors were and they were going to charge him for this. And all he wanted was a simple will and it's very straightforward. And of course, as is always the case, there is always somebody sat in that bar who's able to help. And there was a chap who said, that's not a problem. I can do that for you. I'll write your will. No problem whatsoever. So he wrote the will and he wrote, I leave all my worldly goods to my stepdaughter. And it was signed and it was witnessed and it was valid. And a few years later, he died. And the stepdaughter had been appointed as executrix, so she brought the will in and said, you know, I think I get everything. And we had to point out to her that worldly goods, in the legal sense, actually means chattels. So she had been left all of the furniture, she'd been left all of his clothes, she'd been left his car, she'd been left his cat, um, but she hadn't been left his property or his um, very substantial bank account. Okay, that is not included under worldly goods. Um, and that then became a partial intestacy because there was nobody to inherit that. But he had no relatives. Um, so we had to make a search for his relatives, which took a huge amount of time. Um, and we found some second cousins who actually ended up inheriting his estate rather than his stepdaughter. She had no right to contest the will. She had no grounds to contest the will. It was a valid will. He wasn't under duress. He wasn't mentally incompetent. Um, and, you know, she didn't, she wasn't covered by the intestacy rules. Um, the, the, um, the, the rules for, for like a, a child to be able to contest because she was a stepchild. So ultimately the poor lady missed out on what she was intending to have. Um, and it was very frustrating for us as well as professionals because we were unable to help her. Um, legal costs were absolutely massive on this, I've got to say. Um, tracing the relatives um, took a very, very long time. Lots of birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates to make sure who was who. Um, and actually a large part of the estate was depleted by legal costs and tracing costs. Um, he could have had his real profession done for a fraction of the price. So I've talked quite a lot about disaster. I don't want everybody to think that it happens all the time. Okay, these are few and far between, but it's worth just sort of um, pointing it out. And it can happen to the best of us. Okay, so it's not all homemade will. Sometimes it is a professionally drawn up will. So I thought I would end on a disastrous professionally drawn up will. Um, and this is one that has never even been unpicked by the government's best legal advisors, despite them trying for a very long time. So in 1928, um, an anonymous donation was made in a will to the British government, and it was for a sum of £500,000. Now, to give you some idea of the size of that gift, um, these days that would be worth £350 million. Okay, so a very, very sizable gift. But the wording of the gift was that it was intended to clear the entire national debt. Now, when you make a condition like that, that the gift is to clear the entire national debt, the gift has to be big enough to do that. And at the time, the national debt was more than the 500,000. Now, if, the, if it was impossible that that 500,000 was ever enough to clear the entire national debt, the gift would have failed. But the government argued that maybe they would get the national debt down to below that, in which case it should be held until such time as they could get it down and then it could be used. And it is still being held since 1928. And to give you an idea, the national debt is now about 1.5 trillion, um, actually probably a little bit more after this year. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think even the, the 350 million is getting very, very close um, to being impossible and that gift failing. If the gift does fail, they've got to look at the 1928 will to decide where that gift goes. Does it go to the residual beneficiaries or do they have to look at the rules of intestacy? So it could be very interesting, perhaps over the next decade or so. So I thought I'd look at the light-hearted side of will making as well. 
um, because a will is a chance for you to have your wishes carried out, your last wishes. You can have the last laugh, if you like, if not the last word. Um, and as I say, I'm going to draw on a few American ones because um, the Americans are, are really quite keen on having the last word in their documents. So I don't know if anybody has ever heard of Gene Rodengray. Um, Gene Rodengray was the creator of Star Trek, um, one of my favourites. Um, and he left a will saying that when he um, died, he wanted to be cremated and he wanted his ashes to be sent into space. Now, I don't think he really thought it through um, because they did honour his wishes, but his ashes were actually um, sent in a Spanish satellite in 1997. I'm sure it's not quite as glamorous as he intended. Um, personally, as a, a private plant solicitor, I have been asked to dispose of ashes in a giant firework. I will let you think about that and exactly how that would pan out. That's somebody having a real sense of humour for their family and friends. And I have one lady who um, had the ashes of both of her parents and she wanted to turn them into diamonds. Um, the trouble is she wanted a diamond for each year and she was told that different people's ashes make different coloured diamonds and she's very concerned she wasn't going to get a matching pair. Um, but again, you could put it in your will and say that when you're cremated, you want to be a diamond. Lots of opportunity. Um, it's a chance for you to choose your final resting place and to give really specific um, instructions. And I think um, we are very, very British over this. We tend not to talk to our family and friends about what our final wishes are. Um, so my sons now are 22 and 23. And if I left it up to them, I would either be buried up the garden um, because that would be nice and easy and straightforward, um, or they'd have me cremated, but then I would sit on the mantelpiece while they argued it out about what should happen to me. All right. It, we just don't talk about it. It's just one of those subjects that doesn't come up. So your will gives you an opportunity to just give a bit of guidance to those that you leave behind. So as a solicitor, I would have really enjoyed organising the funeral of Frederick Barr um, because his wishes were really quite unique um, and probably um, unlikely to catch on, it must be said. Um, for anybody who hasn't heard of him, um, which I think would probably be most of us, he was a chemist and an inventor. Um, apparently gave us freeze-dried ice cream, which is probably why we haven't heard of him, and specialised cooking oil. Um, but the absolute pinnacle of his career was that he invented the Pringles can. I mean, you know, lifetime's work, and he invented the Pringles can. Um, so in his will, of course, he said that his ashes had to be interred in a Pringles can. Um, so when the time team dig that up in years to come, they're going to wonder exactly why he was interred in a Pringles can, but they'll obviously be kept very fresh. So good option. You might want to consider um, attending your own funeral. A bit odd, very odd. Um, what about attending your own funeral outside of your coffin? Even more really odd. Um, well, that was the last wish of American jazz player Lionel Batiste. Um, apparently, he had a real phobia of people looking down on him. Um, so there was a reason for him saying this, is he wanted to be standing. So his instructions were he was to be standing, leaning on a lamp post with his hands on his walking cane, and his hat tipped rakishly to one side. Um, now they had to carry this out, and they did. And for anybody who is really ghoulish, there are photographs on the internet. Okay, so you know they did what he had requested. Funeral wishes are actually a wish. So if you did say that you wanted something that was truly outrageous or completely impossible or actually illegal, um, then it's okay for your executors to say no. We haven't done that. We've got the nearest thing to it. So probably um, enough on funeral arrangements um, and perhaps just on to some odd requests that we've seen in wills. So again, this is an American gentleman, T.N. Zink. We don't know his Christian names. Um, probably wants to, to remain anonymous, actually, given what he wants to do. So he died in 1930. Um, in his will, he left um, an estate of $35,000, which actually was a really large sum of money then. Um, and his instructions were that the sum was to be used to build a womanless library. There were to be um, no female authors, 
into their books for not to be included in the library, and no female patrons. Um, but there is an irony to this story because you only have one child who is a daughter, and his daughter contested the will um, because she had only been left five dollars. And the court agreed with her and gave her the larger proportion of the estate, which meant that the library couldn't be built. Most disappointing, I'm sure. Bit of a theme here about keeping women in their place, so I apologise. Um, but Toronto lawyer Charles Miller, so somebody from my own profession, horrifying. He provided a legacy in his will of £500,000 to the Toronto woman who birthed the most babies in 10 years subsequent to his death. Now, all of his friends said that he was a bit of a joker and that he probably didn't mean it seriously, but of course he was a lawyer. So his will was completely legal and binding on his executors. So they started the competition and it became known in all, in all of the press and the media as the Great Stork Derby. And it continued for the full 10 years. At the end, there were four winners, all four ladies having given birth to nine children each. And they got 125,000 pound legacy each. But personally, I think they really earned it. <laughs> Not something you'd want to do for the money, is it really? So over the centuries, wills have also been used to say sorry as well as having the last word and to try and make somebody realise how much um, somebody cares. So some people may have heard of Jack Benny, who's quite a famous actor, and he was married to Sadie Marks. Now, Jack Benny um, was fairly notorious as um, not exactly being the most faithful of husbands. And Sadie Marks um, had a very, very sharp tongue. Um, so it was not really a marriage made in heaven, shall we say. Um, but actually, he was quite devoted to her. He really loved her. And when he died in 1974, they'd actually been married for 48 years. I don't know whether she would have said it was 48 happy years, but they had been married for 48 years. The day after his funeral, she received a long-stemmed rose um, delivered by a florist. She asked who it had come from, and the florist said that they were unable to give her that, that detail. The following day, she got another rose, and the following day, another one. And this went on for weeks. She couldn't find out where the roses were coming from. And then Jack's will became a public document. And he had left money in his will to ensure that she had a red rose delivered for every day of her life. Um, she survived another nine years, and she received over 3,000 more roses. So quite a romantic gesture, but I don't know if it made up for him being completely unfaithful during a lifetime. Um, so going on to having the last word, there's um, two really great examples of this. So one of them is Henrik Hein. Um, he was a poet and he died in 1856. Um, and he left his estate to his wife. Now, in 1856, it was very difficult for women to own property. Property was held by men. Um, and so a woman left by herself was left in quite a vulnerable position. Um, and he had stipulated that he only left her for everything if she were to remarry. Now, it'd be nice to think that he was thinking, right, if she remarries, she'll be looked after. Um, but unfortunately, he added one sentence to that. And he said, then there will be at least one man who will regret my death. <laughs> so not very pleasant, really. But obviously, let her know exactly how he felt. So perhaps a nicer example of having the last word, and this goes out to John Kelly. Um, you might not know John Kelly, but he was the father of Princess Grace of Monaco. Um, he was also um, an Olympic athlete. Um, he was quite a talented man. He was a multimillionaire. He was a businessman as well. Um, in his wisdom, um, another example of very rich people who decided better to do their own will, he wrote his own will. Um, but we're quite grateful for it because he put in a lot of extra wording that a solicitor would never have included. Um, and I think the wording is probably worth more to his family than anything that he left them. So, so his, his son John he gave all of my personal belongings, such as trophies, rings, jewellery, watching, clothing and athletic equipment, except for my ties, sweaters and socks, as it seems unnecessary to give him something of which he has already taken possession which is rather lovely. He didn't leave anything to Prince Rainer or to his other son-in-laws. And he said, I don't want to give the impression that I'm against son-in-laws, 
If they're the right type, they'll provide for themselves and their family. And what I'm able to give my daughters will help pay the dress shop bills, which if they continued as they started under the very able tutelage of their mother, are going to be quite considerable. An insight, I think, into his humour and warmth and how well he knew his family. So just looking at one last thing in a will um, that has always completely fascinated me, and this is a will that actually allowed us to ascertain the cause of death for the testator, which is very, very unusual. And this is the will of Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, Napoleon apparently had a very fine head of hair that he was very proud of. And therefore, in his will, he said that on his death, his head was to be shaved and his hair was to be distributed between his family and friends. And apparently, they were all very happy to accept the gift, which seems odd. Um, but lots of people got a little bit of Napoleon's hair. Now, obviously, decades on, um, there's been a lot of um, discussion about how Napoleon died. Um, for a very long time, it was thought that he died of arsenic poisoning. Um, in fact, his poor old um, doctor got blamed for it because he was being um, treated for stomach, stomach cancer. And they thought that the, the, the doctor had accidentally poisoned him. But the treatment he was being given um, wasn't arsenic. And now they have analysed his hair samples. They show that there was arsenic in his hair samples. Um, so it's now thought that he either died from arsenic in his wallpaper, um, so that his wallpaper poisoned him, or perhaps a little more sinisterly, that he was secretly poisoned by the English. We will probably ne never know the full details, but at least the doctor has now been let off the hook. So hopefully you would agree that making a will doesn't have to really be a sombre affair. Okay? It can be something that is simple and straightforward, and the solicitor will be able to help you, guide you through anything that you think is more complicated. So if you've got a complicated family situation, or there's something that you, you know, instructions that you really want to give and that you would like to be detailed. Um, I don't want to miss the opportunity while I'm speaking to everybody to just talk about lasting power of attorney and to just very, very briefly mention it. Um, so I'm going to move on to the legal bit, as they say. Um, power of attorney, for those that don't know, there are two types. One is for property and financial affairs, and one is for health and welfare. And they are documents that can be used um, by your chosen attorneys to look after you whilst you're alive but perhaps don't have many competence to be able to look after your own affairs. Okay, so will doesn't come into play until you've died, but a power of attorney makes sure that you're properly looked after whilst you're alive. So in my opinion, it's a lot more um, important. And I've really only got one anecdote that I can tell you on this, um, which is why I feel so passionate about power of attorney. Um, and this was a lady, um, she's in her 50s, she came in to see me with her 80-year-old mother. And she told me that mum was getting a bit older. They talked about the power of attorney and she thought it was time that maybe they had that discussion with mum. And so I sat down with um, the daughter present and we went through it all and I explained to mum that was involved and she said, yes, she'd like to go ahead. And having learned all about power of attorney, the daughter said, well, you know, actually, I've got quite a lot of money. I've got lots of things in my own name. Um, I think it'd be very sensible for me to do it as well. Just as she was leaving my office, she said to me, do you know, my brother has got a small building business. Um, he's five years younger than me. I'm sure that, you know, it would be sensible for him to have something like this. And I said to her, well, of course it would. If something happened to him, who's going to carry on running the business? Um, and she said, I'll speak to him about it. So two weeks later, she came back with mum. They signed all their documents and they were suitably smug about being properly covered, which is always great. I like a client to be happy when they leave. And she said to me, I'm so sorry, I did mention it to my brother, but he doesn't want to go ahead. You know, he thinks it's too much money and he's too young to need one. And you can probably guess what I'm going to say. Um, two months later, he fell off a ladder and he sustained a very, very serious head injury. Um, that meant that he was entirely unable to deal with anything. His sister tried to step in, but she couldn't deal with anything at all. She couldn't deal with his suppliers, she couldn't access his bank account, she couldn't pay his staff. Um, we applied for her to be his deputy, and that sort of application goes to the Court of Protection. 
and it takes at least six months to get to Deputy Ship Order 3. By that time, his business had disappeared, his employees had all moved elsewhere, um, the suppliers were getting liability orders against the business because they hadn't been paid. Um, it was a really, really horrible situation. And all because he didn't think it was necessary. Um, and even more frustrating, what lots of business owners don't realise is lasting power of attorney um, can be offset against your tax. So it's a tax force expense. Um, there really is no reason to not do it, other than the fact that people just don't quite get around to it. So it's why I mention it. Whenever I mention wills, I always mention powers of attorney. Um, and I think people need to realise that you know, these days, the medical professionals will not speak to your next of kin. Okay, they're too scared of being sued. All right, so they want a legal document that gives them the right to speak to the person, whoever they, you know, whoever that is, and take instructions from that person. Likewise, banks, financial institutions, insurance companies. I mean, if you've ever tried to even speak to BT about somebody else's account, you'll know it's nearly impossible to do that unless you've got that person there and they're able to give permission. Power of attorney is an essential document and everybody should have it. So that's me on my hobby horse and I probably um, outstayed my welcome a little bit now. So if anybody has got any questions, I'd be really happy to answer anything at all. Thank you very much, Catherine. That's That was very, very interesting and very, well, I, I don't want to say humorous stories, but some of them were a little <laughs> bit humorous, weren't they? Yeah, they all had a bit yeah. lesson, didn't they? Has anyone got any questions for Catherine at all? Ben? Yes, I've got a question. Um, I, I have listened very carefully to what you said. I've heard this this or similar pitches or, or explanations several times, but I think it's a useful question to ask you again for anybody else who's listening now or watching on demand later, but what can possibly go wrong if parents remarry and there is no new will? Oh, Ben, thank you. What a fantastic question. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, obviously in this day and age, this is a situation that comes up all the time. Okay, so mum and dad um, have a couple of children, they divorce and they both remarry. Okay, so when they remarry, the marriage, each of their marriages automatically revokes any previous will that they've got. Okay, so marriage revokes a will, divorce does not revoke a will. Okay, so a bit of confusion comes from people there. You've then got to look at, do they make another will? So if they make another will, Okay, that's fantastic. So they could make another will and they could perhaps leave everything to the children from you know, the first marriage, or they could leave some to the new spouse and some to the children. Um, but as long as they've provided for their children, there shouldn't be any difficulty. If they don't provide for their children, then they risk their new will being contested. The real problem is, is that lots of people don't realize they have to make a new will. Um, and also, quite often, what happens is people don't want to include the children from their first marriage because they've gone on and they've got children from the second marriage. And they want to leave everything to the children from the second marriage and cut the ones out from the first marriage. Um, they can do that, but again, there is the risk of, of the will being contested. Um, so it's, if there is a second marriage, it's a time when I would say it's essential to have proper legal advice and make sure that the will you've drawn up is going to do what you think it's going to do. Um, and it's also, I think, in a run-up to a marriage, the last thing people are thinking of doing is making a new will. You know, they've got lots of plans on, they're planning their stag and their hen do, and they, you know, they're going to have a wonderful time. They don't think, oh, I ought to go and see the solicitor and make a will. Okay, but it's a time to do that because we can do a will in what is called contemplation of marriage. So we can do it up to a year before the marriage actually takes place. And that would stop the will being revoked by a marriage. Okay, but any previous old wills are automatically revoked. Okay. So definitely one to watch very carefully. I didn't know that the, the marriage revoked the old will. That's very interesting. Does that mean you're panicking now then, Ben? No, I, no, but like all the stories you've told, 
um, it just means that the people who will leave us at some because we're gonna all come to our end at some point won't get what they want and that's that's the shame of it all really I think but that's really really interesting Catherine thank you very much thanks man anyone else got anything they want to ask Catherine No, okay. No. You know, no. So the only other thing that I will mention, I, I'm in smug mode. I have a will. I check it every year. I also have a lasting power of attorney because I've listened to people like you, Catherine, and you probably talking about this in the past. And I've heard a lot of these uh, horror stories. And the, the only other thing I would like to mention is um, talking about children is something that was very important to me that I think you might have touched on is I put in a clause for guardianship for my children so that if my husband and I both died prior to the children being 18, that we'd appointed guardians for them who would take over and would manage um, simple things like, you know, buying them new school uniform or that sort of thing and could help them with, you know, somewhere to live, of course, if they needed it, but also that guardianship. And that was something that I thought was really really important for my family because otherwise they'd all be choosing which one of my brothers they wanted to live with or which one they didn't want to live with based on who had the best PlayStation or something ridiculous like that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So there's two parts to that actually. So in a will, you can appoint guardians for your children. So the guardians are the people that would have day-to-day -day care of them. Okay, so um, sometimes you might do siblings, you might do friends, you might do grandparents. Um, quite often what people try to do is appoint too many guardians because they're trying to be fair to both sides of the family. Um, so say they appoint both sets of grandparents. It's always worth mentioning that the children can only go to one set of grandparents and that that might actually start a bit of a, an argument. Um, but guard, sensible guardians, I would say people who have the same philosophy that you have, who are you know, able to, to raise your children, um, you've also got to look at age, I've got to say, you know, if you've got very elderly parents, how sensible is it to ask them to raise your children if they're only two and three when you make the will? Um, so that's guardians, and it's something that should be in every will for any parent that has a child. Um, the other part to it is trustees. So what quite often people don't realise is when you appoint executors, most wills appoint executors and trustees. Okay, now the trustees are the people that hold the money for your children. So if your children are under 18, um, when you die, the guardians will look after them, the trustees will look after the money, and the trustees can then advance money to the guardians to help them care for those children. All right, sometimes it's the same people, but it doesn't have to be, it can be completely different people. Um, sometimes people choose professional executives and, and trustees because they want it administered completely independently from the family. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely essential. And it's quite frightening actually, how many people with young children don't make wills? You know, it's probably higher than the older population, but I still think it's probably every other parent hasn't got a will to protect their children. And there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a myth, you know, if we're, it sounds awful, doesn't it? But if we're both killed in a car accident, our, our parents would have them, or my sister would take them. Well, in reality, what happens is social services have to step in and they have to put them into foster care whilst they're determining who the right person is to have the children. You know, imagine the children just lost both parents potentially and then they get taken away and they get put with strangers while social services are trying to work out who should look after them. And it's just such a small thing to do a will, you know, it's a couple of hours of your time in total. Mm. But, you know, for whatever reason, I think people are reluctant. I think it's it is, you know, solicitors do have a bit of a, a bad reputation, I'm going to be honest. I think people think that they're going to walk in and it's going to start costing them money from the second that they walk in the door, you know, that the clock is on and that they're going to get a massive bill. Um, they think that they're going to be blinded with science and that they're not going to understand anything that the solicitor says. Um, they think that they're going to be committed immediately and that they might sign something that they didn't understand. And, you know, None of those things are true. You know, we really do try to make it as simple and straightforward 
we would we, we see people with no charge for at least 20 minutes, half an hour to ascertain what they want to do. And if they want to walk away then and they don't want to do anything, that's fine. Um, you get a draft of the document so that you can read it in your own home and decide whether it's what you really wanted or you didn't want. You know, we really do try to make it as easy as possible. I don't know why people don't do it, um, but you can be very smug, Joe, which is good. <laughs> Thank you. Smug mode initiated, as they say. Um, well, you've certainly made this very, very simple and straightforward for us, Catherine, so I thank you very much for that. Is there any other questions um, from anyone else? Adrian, Annabelle, Gina, no? Or have no, we'll uh, make an appointment. Oh, I'll be over to see you, Catherine. <laughs> that would be lovely. It would be, it would be lovely to see both of you. <laughs> okay. yeah. Well, if there's no further questions, I'd like to say thank you again, Catherine, for giving us the time um, today and the time you've taken, obviously, to prepare that and find all those case studies. I'm particularly fond of the Gene Roddenberry one. As a big Trekkie myself, that one, Me I'm too. sure he'd be <laughs> very, very disappointed about being sat on a Spanish satellite, but at least his wishes were carried out. Um, this session will be available on our YouTube channel in the next hour. So if there's anyone you feel would benefit from the advice that Catherine's given or just wants to have a bit of a, a wry smile at some of those horrific stories where it's all gone wrong, then please feel free to invite them onto the YouTube channel to have a look at this. Um, we have three more events coming up tomorrow on day five of the Oval Chamber Business Fair. Um, we're hearing from Brett Dorney, who's a successful entrepreneur and business consultant about how you can build a business on the side. Um, we are back with Yeovil College to hear all about their construction apprenticeships. And then we're hearing from business coach and lifestyle coach, Sarah Hicken from Your Time Coaching about how that elusive thing, work-life balance, how to make time for you and your business. So it's definitely still some really good events to come up to. And there's nearly 100 videos now on the YouTube channel. So if you've missed anything this week, please go and have a look. So thank you very much again, Catherine, for your time and for your expertise. And thank you, everybody else, for coming and joining us. Thanks very much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.